Okay, good morning everybody. John Harris here, Managing Partner with Fortune Management, and it is my pleasure to have Jill Obrachta with us this morning. Um, she is a 20-year veteran of uh, the Clinical Dental Hygiene Arena, specializing in the research, development, and implementation of comprehensive OSHA and HIPAA solutions for the dental office. Um, Jill and her team have empowered tens of thousands of dental teams throughout the Southeast in implementing successful compliance programs over the last two decades, and she's considered one of the nation's leading authorities on uh, OSHA and HIPAA solutions and compliance um, in the dental industry. So I'm ecstatic uh, to get her on with us this morning. Um, uh, I've been getting a lot of questions from a lot of my clients uh, and non-clients, just people in general from both employees and employers as to what are the requirements going to be, what do we do if we can't get the appropriate PPE, what are the clinical protocols going to be, are we going to have to uh, adjust the way that we schedule our patients to reduce the flow of patients coming through the waiting area, what's all that going to look like. So if, if we can provide certainty in any area, I hope that this is one of the, the arenas that we can do so, and I intend to do that this morning with Jill. So I'm grateful to have her on with us this morning. Um, a couple of disclaimers really quick, and then I'll turn it over to her and we can get on to the important stuff. A, if you would like to receive CE uh, for your attendance in this course, please email me directly. Um, my email is John Harris, J-O-N-H-A-R-R-I-S at fortunemgmt.com, or you can reply to your registration email, um, and I'll get that information as well, and then I'll send, to, I'll send out CE for this. Um, I am recording this and I'm going to put this on our YouTube channel. Um, I can't provide CE if you go watch the YouTube video, but if you attend it live, I absolutely can. Uh, but it's going to be there for reference. Um, and so I would highly encourage you, uh, to not only go back and use that for reference, but also to, to recommend that your team watch that. Uh, because one of the things, one of the concerns that's come up is, you know, I've got some team members who, and I'm definitely going to let Jill talk about this too, some team members uh, who may or may not fall into that high risk category, is the work environment safe for me to come into? Are you doing everything required to make sure that it is a suitable environment to, to work in and, and with minimal hazards? Um, and so A, we wanna make sure that we're doing everything that we can possibly do and everything that's required on our end to create a safe work environment. B, make sure that our employees are confident and secure, um, that we have done everything that needs to be done to ensure their safety. Um, and B, you know, uh, just make progress and recover from this thing, rebound strong and have a successful 2020 despite, you know, this little bump in the road. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jill. Uh, and Jill, I'm going to change the host settings over to you. Great. Gosh, well said, John. Well said. That was perfect. Um, so let me just get my slides going here. I don't think you can say it better than that, truly. Um, it's, uh, hold on, you have to click that over, John, and we'll be, there we go. All right, so good. That was really a, a nice uh, way to kind of overview, like, you know, how we have to get prepared. Uh, I think it's important safety, right? Safety for sure. And then um, patient's eyes are going to be on us as well. So thanks for having me, John. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to really speak with your doctors and Certainly going forward, I want you to just kind of reference our website. I have a one hub. We'll talk about my one hub today for everything I'll talk to you about dental office preparedness protocols for COVID. Uh, we have some really cool tools, signs and diagrams and posters. I think I have every link for ADA, CDC, HIPAA, and OSAP. So OSAP is the organization um, the Organization for Asepsis Prevention and Sterilization, that's the organization that trains people like me who are compliance geeks. And uh, so all of that is in one place. So when you're done, just visit there often. And we update that all the time. And once every two weeks, we update the video. Uh, so I'm Jill, I'm, I'm a hygienist. And um, I actually was a clinical hygienist. Remember back at the end of the 80s, there was a dentist in South Florida. I live in South Florida. And uh, this guy, he had the AIDS virus. He was presumed to be opening his bloodstream during dental injections. Uh, consequently, nine of his patients came ill with the AIDS virus. So I was at that ground zero. And at that time, I was running a study group for 30 doctors on OSHA. So what do we do? And that's when Bloodborne Pathogens was born. 
And I think I was so fortunate at that time to be practicing 10 miles from that office. So I got uh, in very much aligned with CDC and I was able to meet one of my long-term mentors, Dr. John Molinari. You may know him as the godfather of infection control. Huh? And uh, that's when I started to realize, wow, we're gonna go back into practice after this craziness. It was a really delicate time in dentistry, super fragile in South Florida. And I realized that we're practicing the art of dentistry, but we have to add compliance. So this is when I sort of started to brand um, OSHA made easy. So it's connect the dots, paint by number, OSHA or HIPAA. So please know I'm a clinician. I'm going to speak to you in terms of being a clinician today. And uh, my team and I, as John said, we, we work with teams all over the country. Uh, in the Southeast, I'll, I'll kind of focus on your states as well so that we kind of know what to do, right? So I'm going to admit some people that are coming in here. All right, so let's move on. And that's enough about me. Today's purpose, um, I will be talking to you about um, clarity for the dental office, safety and management of COVID-19 as you're working with emergencies or going back to work. John mentioned the risk factors. So what classification do all dental for professionals or each group fall into? We'll definitely spend a lot of time on the do's and the don'ts, what we do in the dental practice. Visit often our one hub on dental enhancements. You'll be able to check back on everything we talk about today. And then the two most important things that really should be handled before you return back to full-time patient care, um, solutions for how to best prepare. Every 10 minutes or so, I'll stop so that I'll field some questions, all right? I know you guys are on mute. Thank you. It makes it a lot easier um, to just kind of get through some of the, the bigger stuff, and then I'll take questions every so often. So let's look at the risk factors. Very high to high exposure for dentists, hygienists, dental assistants, anyone working in an aerosol environment, and someone who's suspected or known for COVID positive. It's a little difficult to kind of measure right now because there's not one test that we're all taking to say yay or nay or did I have it and I'm I already just kind of a carrier, right? So it's a high propensity if we're working in an aerosol environment. Medium risk for admin team and then lower risk the way we're working now, working from home. So admin who who's not exposed to anyone. And we'll talk about the safeguards, certainly for your medium and your high risk. So the ADA um, has created uh, this stance in relation to government um, mandates, right? That we're now working only in an elective type um, dental care. So during this um, presentation, I'm really going to reference a lot of the information for the interim emergency type care. And then I'll talk about what will kind of come over as we go back into full-time practice. So a lot of it will be reflective as we go back into uh, practice. You may have seen this on the ADA website. On our link, on our OneHub we refer to this a lot, the ADA's Interim Guide for Management of Emergency Care. And it's about 10, 15 pages. Uh, it has these flow charts. They call these flow charts algorithms. Now they look kind of complicated, but if you really just look at some of the, the lower parts, like the urgent care on the bottom, this is how do you triage? How do you decide what's an emergency versus what isn't? I think this is basic knowledge, but at least it's there. So if you want to make a reference, it's right there. The next algorithm, this is algorithm number two in this document. It says what PPE, um, I'm sorry, what's the proper screening, the questionnaire that you should do with the patient when they're on the phone and you're making that emergency appointment? Now, I think it's important if you're making an appointment and they're not showing up for a day or two, we have some little signs on our website that you can print out and it just, you post them outside of your office if it's conducive to do that. It says, stop, wait in your vehicle and give us a call from your cell phone. You'll do, repeat this screening. That's going to be another safety measure to take before the patient comes into the office. Best to have someone go out to the vehicle to escort the client in. Now, if your office is not set up in that fashion, you'll have to make some considerations and it's good to kind of start thinking now, how are we going to set up our waiting room so that we can have six foot distance or where can be a safe area for 
patients to wait uh, in this emergency treatment. Usually with emergency treatments, it's not going to be that um, terrible to manage. Once we go back into patient care, it's important to know, I can only speak to you right now about what we're doing now during the uh, interim care, and then we'll have some updates, right? Things to think about, food for thought when we go back into practice. The third algorithm that the ADA gives us, I think this one is the most difficult to get through. It's five levels, and this really is minimizing your risk of transmission. It focuses a lot on our headgear, the PPE, what we're going to wear when we go back into practice. So I spent about a week getting pretty intimate with this algorithm, and I'm going to just kind of really get it down to the basics. There are three different choices when it comes to PPE that you'll be wearing. Um, of course, you're going to wear a full um, lab coat, and you'll have your gloves, and even surgical gowns, sometimes head uh, hair covering. But let's talk about the three different choices for PPE. So there's choice A, the ADA's choice A for PPE would be wearing an N95 respirator. It's a lot of preparation and expense with that. So we'll make clarification. Is that a good choice? Is that not? I think choice B is going to be favored among dental professionals. Choice B says you'll wear uh, a level three mask, protective eyewear with side shields, and a face shield. Choice C will be to wear the level three mask and protective eyewear with side shields. So let's look at this a little in a little bit more detail. I pulled apart that algorithm because it was just so complicated. And I just like when things are a little bit more simplistic. So now we'll review your choices for headgear for PPE as you go back into uh, clinical care. Now this applies to emergencies. I believe as we go back in, we'll be going, it's gonna get real complicated and real crazy. And I think as we go back into clinical practice, we'll be able to kind of keep updates and understand. I really think we're gonna stay with, with zone B is gonna be choice B will be the, the easiest choice. Now, as I created this, little table that we're going to look at. It will review choice option A, B, and C from the ADA as it applies for the interim care of emergency patients. And these are dealing with aerosol procedures. So you'll see your risks greatly decrease if you're performing non-aerosol procedures, but let's face it, in dentistry, we perform aerosol procedures. So there you have it. Uh, plan A, option A, is choosing an N95 protective mask with the eyewear, side shields, and your face shield. I think choice B is really going to be a favored choice among dental professionals. It's easy. We're used to getting surgical masks. Make them level three. Your eyewear, make sure there's side protection on the eyewear. So if you're wearing prescription glasses or loops, you definitely want that 3D face shield. And some of the face shields have been out of stock, but coming back into stock. So definitely stock up and uh, make sure that the side protection on the eyewear, that's really important if you're not wearing, you know, uh, you have to kind of compromise a little bit if you're wearing prescription glasses or loops. C, option C, just takes away that face shield. I just think it's an added level of protection. So B, for me, that's the zone or that would be the, the aisle that I'd want to be running in. Um, with choice A, it becomes a, a little difficult for a N95 because you do have to do a fit test before that um, employee can wear the mask. There's also, they have to volunteer. You have to have a volunteer, uh, volunteer disclaimer. So um, we have created some of these forms just to make it easier. Uh, and some of these N95s will require that the employee goes through a medical test, a physical fitness test for sure, to see if they can wear the N95. That thing suctions against your face for up to eight hours. So it can be overwhelming. It can be um, deprive the person of oxygen. So a lung capacity test for some of the masks uh, do need to be um, involved in the test process. Now, if I were to 
to practice at a best practices level, I definitely would want the employee that's going to choose to wear an N95 to go through the medical questionnaire, the medical evaluation, and just make sure they're safe and sound. Not everyone can wear an N95. So we'll look at that in a bit more detail. For option B, it's a no-brainer. We know how to fit a level three mask and your eyewear and your shields. Same thing with level C. So it becomes a lot easier. If it's possible, now in an ideal world, you would want a patient to know, are you positive or negative? And did you have a test prior to coming in for your emergency treatment? That's an ideal. That's not always gonna be able to be something that happens. Other requirements for PPE, wear the proper size gloves, wear a cloth or a disposable lab coat. If you're wearing a lab coat, they do have levels of protection. So a level two or or three is more fluid resistant. Being able to wash your lab coat on site is even better. Um, puncture proof utility gloves need to be provided for every employee that handles soiled instruments. So make sure uh, that would be part of your prep list before going back to work. Uh, disinfection and in instrument transport. Cover the instruments, make sure that you transport them safely. Uh, reusable PPE would be disinfected immediately. And that's across the board for a plan A, B, or C. Now, after treatment, this is where the ADA's algorithm gets a little bit intense. Um, you want to tell your patient, please go for um, uh, a test. After you had dental treatment, we recommend having a COVID-19 test. Say that you went for uh, dental treatment. Now, exposed clinicians, if, if there, it happened to be that your patient was actively positive, if you were wearing an N95, here's where all the trouble of wearing an N95 pays off because you would not have to, um, it wouldn't be recommended to go back into self-quarantine. So that's that algorithm. It's a bit um, maybe intimidating at first, but I'm telling you, if we stay in this zone B, and I will speak a lot about zone B today, I like to bring up N95 masks because they are a possibility for you to wear. There's a lot of controversy about N95 masks. When we go through a few more slides, I'll point out as well, it doesn't matter which option that you choose. You will have to have a pandemic preparedness plan. Part of your pandemic preparedness written plan is, hey, we're going to write down what we'll do in, and we'll have a, co a contingency plan for team members, for supplies, for how we're going to handle and triage patients. But also in your pandemic preparedness plan, you have to have a written respiratory protection plan. And it's easier if you're just dealing with plan B or C, your regular PPE, it gets to be way more intense if you're going to go down the route of wearing an N95 mask. And that would mean you have to take a fit test. I'll show you what a fit test is. What comes in the fit test? What does an N95 look like? How do we do a fit test? Um, and then best practices would be to give your, every employee who volunteers a disclaimer sheet that they know the pros and cons, the risks and benefits of wearing the N95, how to take care of the N95 mask, dispose of it, um, make sure it's disinfected, replace it when it is not, and then go for a medical exam. I would say that for me, if I was a dental practice owner, I would really want to make sure that my team member was comfortable and didn't have any lung capacity or breathing problems. And then you're golden to wear the N95. Now, I want to just stop for a moment and see if there's any questions. So anything before we go on, I'm going to show what a fit test test is. We'll talk a lot more about the N95, but any questions before I move forward? John, anything for you? Uh, I actually do have a couple. Um, I'm curious about, well, two things. <clears throat> I don't see any questions in the chat box, so we'll, we'll hold off uh, in case any of those come in. Um, on the, obviously, you know, the state, the governor of Tennessee as of now says that we can go back May 4th. Actually, I think it's April 30. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, however, the, I haven't seen an update from the ADA as to what their recommendation is. So mm. just like, you know, when we shut down, there wasn't a mandated state closure in place that the ADA came out and said, hey, we want everybody closed until April 30th, and then everybody shut down. So just because, you know, the state says we can come back on the 4th or the 30th, 
doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to open up there. I think we're basically waiting on the ADA's recommendation. So any idea as to when we can expect an update? Yeah. Just yesterday they made a statement and it is once you go on to the dental enhancements website, you can Google search it ADA statement. It came out um, yesterday and it says, Hey, we're going to really stick with what we said during this interim. And um, again, plan B, I think plan B is the, the safe, the safe, quick, and, and just like it, it provides some sense of like being normal, but being hyper vigilant without going down the road of plan A with the N95. So they did make the statement yesterday and there's a diagram. They uh, also made a clarification on masks. So they show you an N95 versus some regular masks and we'll look at that diagram as well. So mainly it's headgear that they're focusing on. Also, the doctor does have to have the written plan right? You have to train your team. Definitely have to train your team for safety. And you have to make some efforts, some concerted efforts that you're going to do something to control aerosols within the office. As I go through the presentation today, I'll take you through that. Okay. So they're leaning back on this original uh, emergency interim guide. They're saying, hey, we want you to take that back into practice and then uh, have a written plan. So a respiratory preparedness plan, um, a pandemic prevention written plan. You got to get your OSHA stuff back in order, right? As far as written things go. And then your team members should be trained on Dental Enhancements website. We have excerpts, these exact slides for free. So we're just giving that to um, clinicians at no charge. Uh, if you decided to go through any kind of additional solutions with us, we'll give CE for that, but it's free to the public to just watch the video and uh, just making sure that you have your written programs in place, that you choose your PPE wisely, and then your team members are comfortable. Remember, all eyes are gonna be focused on the practice owner and the clinicians. So adding something different, more better different to control aerosols. I'll show some videos now on that, cool. Uh, doctor, one, one of the doctors, uh, Dr. V had a question. Can you look at questions on your, on your end, John, so I can answer that? Um, does the fit check apply to the KN95 as well? You would have to check for, with the manufacturer. So if you're buying any particular mask, 3M is amazing. 3M has video, video on YouTube, so you don't have to read through all the, the documents. I would ask at your, um, call the manufacturer. And they have these hotlines right now that are really OSHA specific, and they'll be able to tell you. So I believe most of those do, but please do check. If I was a dentist, I would really want to make sure that I had the OSHA questionnaire and, and my employees' uh, voluntary disclaimer signed and make sure that their lung capacity is not such that they're gonna start feeling dizzy, headachy, oxygen deprived, um, tired. Those masks also hug so close on the face that you could feel some, you know, you don't want scarring or anything like that. So it's really important, and we'll go through that right now to show kind of the, some of the, the side effects. Was that the only question? Uh, it's actually a couple more, let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a specific outline to follow for making a pandemic preparedness plan or I imagine a respiratory preparedness plan? Yes. And you don't want to be me because I just um, spent my, the last two and a half weeks. You can ask my husband. It was not a fun adventure. I took 300 government documents, 300 pages and condensed it down into a 50 page fill in the blank check mark PDF. So it's not a fun adventure and it does have to have certain components. So anything from um, your contingency plan and that respiratory preparedness plan, what you'll do for um, safeguarding patients, choices you'll make for all of your PPE, your phone message, your email message, your text message, if you have automation, if you're going to practice teledentistry. So the, the, actual program will help you now sort of in retrospect but what we've learned from this situation will help us to be better prepared if we ever face this going forward that's a great question so i will show you um our template and if not you can make your own template as well perfect so that's something that they, and we'll get your contact details and everything at the end mm -hmm. so anybody that wants to reach out can reach out right. 
guidance. And I'm sure you've probably got resources you can send. And oh, all yeah. So, I even have it where they can click and make their own. But when I started to click and make my own, I'm like, oh, my gosh. So is it there's the government template, as it usually is. And then there's another and another. So you have to combine these 300 pages. So we made ours really affordable, really easy. I'm all about like, just connect the dots, get it done so you can focus on going back to dentistry. Uh, and, and if you do either option, you could either do your own or you can have the opportunity to kind of look at our templated solution. Right. And, and I, then other questions? Yeah, and I can speak from personal experience because I did, um, I dabbled in the ocean HIPAA space um, coming out of my previous career when I came over into dentistry uh, for a few years. And I'm telling you, it's an extraordinarily complex landscape. <laughs> so I would not recommend to anybody to, you know, uh, try to recreate the wheel. The stuff's already done that the, I'm telling you, it's just, it's going to save you headache. It, it's totally worth the investment. Um, I would absolutely 100% recommend that you get plus the stuff changes constantly. So as up to date as you think that you are, yeah. You're almost always out of date. <laughs> so, you got it, John. You got it. And that's why we use a lot of portals so that everything keeps updating. And then we update our videos and portals. So it's tricky, but you kind of have to really do that. It's definitely a delicate science. You guys don't want to be me right now. That's for sure. <laughs> it's definitely not fun. I'm really putting in about 16 hour days because I'm really committed that everything stays up to date and in one spot and that it's just, you know, cohesive and streamlined. I mean, you have enough other stuff to worry about, right? You want to be able to connect the dots on something, right? I guess that's why we're here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then other one questions. last question and we'll jump back in. And this is actually my question. Uh, and I, and forgive me for my ignorance. This isn't my space. I'm seeing a lot of people using their 3d printers to 3d print masks. What's the, what's the validity there? Is that a, is that going to be an acceptable form of PPE? To make their own? Huh, the 3D print masks? Yeah. So, God, it's so creative, isn't it? It's yeah, creative what uh, you see out there. But CDC has never, CDC, OSHA, and ADA never changed their stance. The right answer is one mask per patient that is medically accepted, a surgical level three. So, you know, uh, inside of our pandemic preparedness um, template, we kind of made up a way to, to stock up. So I would say this, please right now, if you're used to ordering from one vendor, it's time to go out and seek other vendors to try to get their, their rationing, right? They're rationing masks, they're rationing these face shields, they're rationing a lot of PPE. So it would be time to stock up and get your rations from multiple suppliers, and I've even had team members uh, go out and they make sort of like a little office kitty and they say, hey, I'm going to go and try to get masks as well. And then there's a reimbursement plan. So you have to start to be creative. And definitely, if you haven't already started to um, stock up, part of your written respiratory protection plan is that you would never ask an employee to work without proper PPE and uh, having it enough of it on hand. So we kind of overlap when I'm, we're connecting the dots on your respiratory protection plan. It's, it it's goes over and over and over. You have to have the level three in the clinical area that is supplied by a manufacturer, not make your own. Yeah. Okay. Great question. Really good. All Love right. it. All good. right. You ready to go? Let's take a look and we're going to go back into the world of an N95. Um, not that I'm saying this is an easy road to take, but uh, let's look at what an N95 fit test actually is, right? So hopefully my little video plays here. Uh, hopefully, let's see why we're, we're kind of stuck on this, but let's go back in here and see if I can get this to play. Um, so if it doesn't, oh, there we go. So you're going to see those are what an N95 looks like. There's different um, types, and this is the kit. So you get sort of an astronaut looking mask and then there are different flavors and nebulizers. There's either a sweet spray or a bitter spray. You fill up the nebulizer with the bitter or sweet solution. And then the volunteer employee, right? They're gonna volunteer, they wanna wear an N95. Uh, they will get tested so that they cannot taste that spray. So it should be an airtight seal on their face, right? So that's kind of what the fit test looks like. 
This is how you don an N95. You make sure that upper strap fits flat and then the lower strap goes below the ears and it has to be flat on the neck. To fit it yourself, every time you wear it, you have to do a quick seal test and that's by breathing in two or three times to make sure that it seals. So before a dental practice owner issues an N95 mask, uh, they should definitely understand uh, the precautions and the risks. Uh, of an N95. They should have a voluntary disclaimer signed and kept on file uh, by the employee. Now the employee, these two are best practices, but definitely I would make sure that you give a respiratory questionnaire to your employee. They go to a uh, physician or a qualified um, medical professional uh, to get a medical clearance. Not with every design are these two applicable, but to reduce liability to the practice owner, I would definitely still go with the medical uh, respiratory questionnaire. We include that in our um, respiratory template, the, the preparedness, and then have them get a medical clearance. The last thing you wanna do is have someone feel uncomfortable, claustrophobic, get headaches, get oxygen deprived. So those two that I have in red are going to be um, best practices. You must have a voluntary disclaimer signed, you must perform a fit test, and you must have a written respiratory protection plan. N95 has a lot of preparation. Once it's in place, you may feel more comfortable and confident. From what I'm reading, I'm still seeing that that option B, where you do the class three traditional surgical mask, your protective eyewear, and then the face shield. So this, for me, is what I see going down the path of least resistance, but also really making sure your teams are uh, covered. Over the last couple of weeks, when I started to really dive into this, um, all of these documents, I've watched on TV what, what the frontline um, healthcare workers are wearing. And you'll see nine times out of 10, God, sometimes they don't even have the eyewear on, but I'm like, okay, they are not in an aerosol environment with saliva. I would say choosing option B, I would urge you to feel very confident unless the ADA comes out with something more rigorous. This seems to me to be a really good option. Um, but, you know, the 95s are there. And if you feel that you want that added level of protection, ADA, this is interim guidance. Yesterday, the ADA put out a new guide that said, we're going to go with this. Um, so return to workplace protocols may update more. So please check back on the Dental Enhancements website. Uh, we are updating everything from the ADA, CDC, OSHA, and even HIPAA guidance. All right. So that's the story with masks. Coming back to work, we already know that patients have fears they'll definitely have some different kind of fears and be watching to ensure uh, that we're giving them a good environment to protect them against COVID as well. So teams should really be focused on infection control and updating your OSHA with a heavy focus on infection control is going to be imperative. So team members to get educated first. And now let's talk about some of the things to do as you go back into practice, right? So keeping updated on ADA, CDC, OSHA, right? We said that's really important to see where we're gonna be guided over the next two or three weeks. Hand washing we know is important, but did you know that dry hands um, are even more important? So damp hands spread about a thousand times more germs. Stocking up on your sea fold towels and drying your hands twice before you re-glove. Hand sanitizers we know are no substitute for hand washing. Follow the CDC and OSHA infection control updates. In 2016, there was a huge update to dental protocols. There's 13 new infection control protocols. It kind of elevates us almost to a hospital grade level of um, sterilization and disinfection. So I'll show you in a slide or two, there is a new uh, summary of infection, it's called in infection prevention for the dental setting. And this would be 13 new protocols 
uh, that were required since 2016. Now, in the OSHA course that we teach, um, this is a main focus. So what changes? Universal precautions change. What you do with your hand pieces, how you run your sterilizers, you have to make sure that every single load, you're testing multi-parameters of um, time, temperature, and pressure is met. Uh, there are updates for your water being tested, every single dental chair to be tested every single either quarter, sometimes it can be weekly as well. So there's a lot of new things, right? So definitely following these new guidelines that the CDC and OSHA put out in 2016. You should have those in written form and then also in, um, in practice. Wearing PPE properly, as John had asked, make sure that you're wearing one mask, that it's not homemade, that you're not trying to re-sterilize or disinfect the mask. Stocking up on masks is going to be imperative. And then suit up. Hypervigilance is really what's in. That's key. That's going to be really core as you go back to work. The visors, that gives you the added protection. Your masks, I can't talk about that enough, and the eyewear with side protection. Hair covers and gowns are becoming popular because there's some controversy. Does the COVID virus live on hair and, and clothing? Even if you're wearing a lab coat, sometimes to put that extra layer of protection with a surgical gown. And if it's possible to wash your lab coats in office, even better. If not, the, um, the lab coats that are disposable should be of a level two or a level three that are fluid resistant. They say, and OSHA's standing by this right now, as of today, that lab coats should be um, disposed of when visibly soiled. That gets tricky with the COVID virus, right? Um, and it brings me to my next um, point about what do you do with the waste, right? Things that are covered in either saliva or some blood splatter. So in every single single treatment room, you should have a small little red bag. Usually they have some adhesive on, and on them and you can kind of tape them to the inside of a cabinet door. Um, our current law for disposing of biomedical waste is if it's saturated with blood or saliva, you put it in that little red bag, you have to seal the red bag before you walk it down to the bigger red bag or the biomedical waste container. That's a current law. That's been a law since 2008. Little tiny red bags go in every single treatment room. You seal up the waste and walk it to the bigger biomedical waste container. During COVID-19 and as we return to work, it's best practices to please put splattered waste in these bags. You'll have the bags anyway. And to not have to rehandle saliva ejectors, splattered bibs, splattered gloves, even lab coats when you feel it's time to take off, Put them in the little red bag, seal that thing up, and put it down the hall into the bigger red bag. Confirm your patient's appointments. Make sure that they have wellness, so taking them through a screening. Pre-screening them again before they come into the office for an appointment. Utilizing either reception signs or signs that you'll place outside of your um of your office to say, hey, wait in your vehicle, call us from your cell phone, we'll escort you in. You have to have some planning as we go truly back to work. There'll still probably be six foot um, type of um, uh, distancing for all individuals. So make sure you're starting to think that out. And how does that work in your actual work environment? But utilizing outdoors or outside or in vehicle is really great. And then once you go through with updating your infection control, choosing your headgear, understanding how you're going to choreograph patients coming into the office and being seen, showcase your infection control practices. Make sure your team is trained and updated in all, everything OSHA, certainly infection control and COVID-19 preparedness. And then that can be the new focus of your practice. Now I'm going to talk about some considerations. None of these are ADA or CDC you know, mandated, but because doctors have to also 
um, choose certain things in the office to make sure that it seems that you're controlling aerosols. These are popular. This is a machine. It's a bio aerosol uh, dental suction system. It's mobile. It works on a HIPAA filter, and behind that HIPAA filter, it has the UV light. So, you know, some doctors are saying, hey, I don't even care if this is a toy. I'm going to get it. It looks great. Other doctors are not liking it because they're made in China. They're put together and assembled in Canada. They're difficult to get. I know that the top three dental suppliers, actually a lot of the, even the smaller dental suppliers have these. These run about $2,700. It just depends. Is that going to be something that you think is really uh, helpful and good to control aerosols, a consideration worth looking into. Another consideration to look into will be these innovative air purification panels. These work again by having a HIPAA filter, a UV light, light and they are hidden up in the light panels. They're used a lot in nursing homes and hospitals to control C. diff and to control MRSA. So Maybe they're more hidden away, but definitely peace of mind. These do have scientific backing. So if you're ordering these, the ones you see here are by VitaShield, V-I-D-A, VitaShield. So those are things that are, have more scientific backing if you're looking for um, quality control air. Right now, if we're looking at our um, train of infection control, we do surface infection, hand hygiene, PPE, but we're kind of wide open on controlling the air. So these filters uh, do give you a, a bit more of a uh, closed system for infection control and air purification. They do have to be maintained, so they have to be changed out. This is something that I just um, came across this week. These are micro um, killing barrier fogger systems, and they use a um, chemical to attach, it's like a spiky surface that goes on the chemical, or I'm sorry, the chemical gets sprayed on the surface. They're used industrially, and they'll also be used in healthcare facilities. And that spikiness kind of just destroys uh, the uh, virus. So those are available. And um, I, again, don't know the safety, the availability, uh, but these fogger systems, this one's by SKN. So SKN Microsure, something to check into. Hmm? I think this one is a consideration that would be a lot easier. Um, you may be familiar with the Dry Shield Isolate system, where it's a bite block and a high-speed evacuator system in one. So these are really a favorite among um, dentists right now to get stocked up on these. And again, we're looking to somehow reduce the aerosols so that as we go back into practice, we're educating the team on their own safety, choosing the right PPE and headgear, and then making sure as we go back in, we're controlling aerosols a little bit more um, with more hypervigilance and making sure you have a written plan, right? A respiratory protection plan or a pandemic preparedness plan. Now, before I go forward. We talked about the to-dos and we talked about the considerations for getting ready to go back to work, best practices. John, tell me, are there any questions or do you have any other questions that I can answer at this point? Yes, ma'am. We've got several. Uh, okay. Let's see. I, th I had one that popped up. Uh, maybe it'll come to me before we get through all these. So let's see here. Uh, what is the advisement of wearing N95 and then a fabric mask over the top? and changing the fabric mask while preserving the single N95 for longer term use. So yeah, those N95s are kind of cloth and they're really made for dust particles, right? So they're more made for particulate matter. Even there's a disclaimer on a lot of the N95s that say, hey, we're not saying these are great uh, for use if you're controlling viruses, but you do see a lot of the frontline um, healthcare workers wearing them. Um, you know, that's a good idea, but Again, I'm, a, I'm just a trainer, so I wouldn't want to overstep what OSHA, the ADA, or the CDC is saying. If you did that, I think it might be a practical thing where, wow, I, I, this is making logical sense. But I always like to make sure that you're going to be safe if you have a health department or an OSHA inspection. So I'm not sure at this point 
that that's going to be something that would be advisable from an inspection point of view. So while it might be logical and it does preserve it, you'd have to really go through the specifications and making sure you have a really solid respiratory protection program, follow those steps. I think it's great to preserve it, but I wouldn't rely on that alone if you're going to talk to an inspector, right? What, what makes sense is not always uh, according to the rules. Right, right. And, you know, they come in and they're looking to make sure everyone's the, protected the right way in accordance with the law. You can take that as an extra step. But I certainly wouldn't say that's what you're doing. You want to show someone your respiratory protection plan and have things really logically spelled out. And uh, those N95s also come with, you, you have to have a decontamination system. So you're either going to toss them, by the way, they get tossed into a biomedical waste container. So you don't just toss them in the trash. They would be considered biomedical waste. Uh, there are decontamination uh, units that look like a dry clave. They're not a dry clave. They're specifically made for the N95, and uh, they run about $7,000. So that's what a health department or an OSHA inspector would look for if you're implementing a full N95 program. I read yesterday uh, there was I get really strange compliance news because I'm a geek, but um, the inventor of the N95 mask is coming out of retirement to try to quickly invent a sterilizable uh, mask. So look for that, right? Maybe that'll happen quicker than we know. Yeah, interesting. Good question. And I, think, I think the intention there would be obviously to kind of, kind of uh, mitigate costs associated with mm -hmm. sure. requirements. And what I would tell you there just from a business perspective is as long as you're staying on top of your fee schedule and keeping your fee schedule current, and as long as you're re renegotiating your, your dental insurance reimbursements, you know, every two to three years, um, as long as you're, you know, scheduling effectively and efficiently and maximizing productivity throughout the day, I don't think cost is really a legitimate concern. You know, if cost is going to be a concern if we're not doing all the other stuff, right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use cost as the logic behind not having the appropriate PPE and materials and items present. I would make sure I'm doing all the other stuff. You know, yeah, and, awesome. yeah, and on that note, John, I would also say, I don't think people are going to mind. I mean, you know, ten years ago for an infection control fee, I think people would be, I would be certainly amenable to a twenty or twenty-five dollar infection control fee. So you know, consider that as well. The world's going to change. There's going to be a new age of dentistry, yeah. and I think people would almost, can you believe it, appreciate an infection control fee. So make sure that you maybe consider that when it comes to cost, right? Uh, next question is, as an endodontist, uh, I use a microscope. I cannot use eye shields with my scope. What is the recommendation? What's the recommendation for us? So that's interesting, right? So you have your, your scope and you can't do the, the shield. Um, that would be kind of counterintuitive to what the ADA put out in their algorithm, for choice A, B, and C. So you're saying you can't have the shield um, in front of your eyes, right? Correct. That's I would definitely check back and, and uh, go on the ADA. You have access probably more than I do, but certainly from the Endodontics Society, see if they made another statement regarding that. Absolutely have all this PPE in the headgear for your team. And then I think that that's something that you really have to consider because if you have to go in your scope and then out and then putting on the shield it might come down to something like that that you have it there but that is a really slippery slope and that one's a tricky one I definitely see if there's anything on the endodontic association i have not seen that as of yet but i see that that's a it's kind of a a black hole there right you have yeah. to figure that one out i imagine there's other people that have had that same concern and that same question so somebody somebody somewhere that the people that are far superior and smarter than myself have already done the yeah. research and came up with the information. So the answer to that question is out there. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, just like Jill said, I would check with the endodontic association. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and if we wear long sleeves and scrubs that are washed in office, do we still need a gown? You do. You still need a fluid resistant lab coat, a lab coat. And you learn this when you go through your annual OSHA training session, right? This is part of basic PPE. I'll show it to you on a slide that's coming up. But um, 
the long sleeve is not fluid resistant. So please, you know, sometimes people are cold or they're not cold, but having the level two or level three, if it's a disposable gown or a fluid resistant gown, even if you're washing in office, you must have those lab coats available. If you're going to go even further and get those thinner, but more coverage of the long gowns, I think that's a best practice. What's absolutely required is a fluid resistant cloth lab coat if you wash in office or a disposable level two or three. Great question. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any others? Uh, do we need, uh, let's see here. We're good to go. Uh, do we need a new one for each patient? You know, the law for OSHA is if it's visibly soiled, I would imagine over the next several months that CDC and OSHA will put their heads together and say, hmm, you know, COVID is an aerosol. How often do we have to change it? Do you have to go with those level two or level three? Can you have a, a thinner one? So some of these are to be determined, right? So I, I would say stay tuned for more on that how can you say if it's visibly soiled i mean you can't see the aerosol right so i think the current law needs to catch up to where we're going for the new age of practice and again as human beings i think we want to know and we want to push forward and you know we live in the usa we work in the usa we want to go you know we're on go time that's an area for me that i find challenging because it has to be rewritten and to be determined so some doctors, depends what your infection control, um, your budget and your infection control fees will be. If you feel like, hey, I'm not going to compromise, I want to be changing every time, then that might be something that you write into your protocols and that's part of your infection control costs, right? The fees that will be adjusted. Other times, uh, offices, they just don't want to do that kind of landfill. So it's not something that OSHA and CDC has clarified for us yet. Perfect. And we're going to do, uh, Jill and I were talking as we started this thing this morning is we're going to do probably one, two, maybe even three more of these updates over the next several weeks as we begin to prepare uh, and as uh, to, 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 for the rebound. And then obviously as all these updates and changes um, come about, we're going to, we're, we'll hook back up and we'll make sure that, that, you know, when there are changes and things like that, that we're getting the information out to everybody. And Absolutely. I would certainly recommend, you know, visiting her website when we're done and subscribing to her. I'm sure that you've got an option on your website somewhere where they can subscribe mm -hmm. to a, sure. a, a, an email list or something like that to where anytime there are updates and things that are relevant to the landscape that, that we're, we're in, you're going to get that information as soon as it becomes available. Sure, sure. And you can always visit our website. Uh, I'll show you coming up here in a minute how you can navigate to our COVID-1 hub. So awesome. Great questions. Let's go on and see the things we don't want to do when we go back into the work environment. We don't want to ignore updates. Definitely infection control. The whole team has to be unified in taking pride on this stuff. Don't miss scheduled OSHA updates. If you're due for annual OSHA or you haven't done it in a long time, it's the time is now. I have a lot of offices that seem para paralyzed and they're like, oh, we're going to postpone. We're going to do it when we get back. Um, it's a requirement that you're doing your OSHA updates now and make sure your team knows safety and you know the infection control rigors and policies and protocols that you'll be going through. So uh, even if you are all separated and not in one uh, situation, you can see how we're learning now. This is our wheelhouse for my trainers and, and myself. I have trainers all over the country. And if you're all separated, you can either sign on to have a webinar. Our most popular right now is to learn via video and then just check back in with our trainers and then we can answer questions and offer CE. So please make sure that you're doing your updates uh, before you sit down for clinical practice, right? Don't take shortcuts with hand washing, PPE, infection control. Never use any PPE that's truly disposable. If you're sick, don't come to work. Really screen for um, doing your screenings for any uh, patients being sick. Now, it's important and employers have an obligation to record 
and report if an employee is COVID positive within 48 hours, you do report that to your local health department. Part of your respiratory preparedness plan is having that phone number and then having the forms that are appropriate to submit if uh, a patient, if an employee um, becomes COVID positive. So we do supply the forms uh, and, and the logs that you need from uh, OSHA and then to supply for your local health department. Employees have to self-monitor. So a doctor, uh, a practice owner can't take the temperature of an employee, but um, they can ask it to, for the employee to please be very hypervigilant if uh, they're noticing any signs or symptoms. Doctors can take and should take the temperature of patients. That's part of normal vital signs. If you can't find a touchless thermometer, get one that you can easily uh, thread one of those uh, disposable sleeves upon and make that part of your uh, intake information, right? That's another thing for your go back to work prep list uh, that would be good to put on that list. This is what OSHA says. OSHA says currently in relation to COVID, you have to do what we've always said to do. Wear all of the PPE. So the protective eyewear with side shields, properly fitting gloves, puncture-proof utility gloves uh, for every person that handled soiled instruments. How much can we talk about the mask, one per patient, a properly fitted lab coat, and then for high decibel procedures with turbine or ultrasonic and hand pieces, they want ear protection. So that's the basic. Also, OSHA says, a uh, practice owner needs to provide a workplace free of harm or serious hazard. That's where writing these new updated written plans, the pandemic preparedness plan with a contingency plan and the written respiratory plan is really uh, important. This is that document that I told you about. OSHA and the CDC back in 2016 got together. Uh, OSHA said, hey, CDC, you do all the research. We only give the fines. Tell us how dentists are doing with infection control and disease prevention. Since the CDC studies and does all the research on this, they rewrote a 44-page document. It has 13 different uh, infection control requirements. These are the basic expectation. So CDC makes the rules and studies the rules and OSHA enforces them. This is a great read. You can literally Google search this term and come up with the um, PDF. This is one chapter in our OSHA binder, a huge part of our OSHA training. So we go through each one of the 13 changes uh, of, that should already be implemented inside of your practice. Now, Tennessee had some issues uh, a few years back. Uh, they were having um, a big focus from OSHA inspectors. There's also a checklist for Tennessee to make sure that they're going through certain rigors for OSHA and infection control. And again, with any one of our training modules, if there's state specifics, we do give Tennessee that questionnaire to make sure that's printed and put in your OSHA binder as well. It starts to get crazy with the paperwork to keep track of all of it. Another thing that OSHA says is if a federal law, whichever is the stricter law, the federal or the state law, so 28 states have stricter guidance. I already spoke about Tennessee's. They have an extra 10-page uh, questionnaire to make sure they're following uh, the OSHA um, guidance for their state, right? And um, so make sure that you have provisions that when you're doing your written updates for OSHA that you understand is the federal law stricter or is the state law stricter? And then uh, if you're working with a coach, make sure that the coaches understand and know and that you could just get everything and uh, understand it when you're doing your training and also have it written. And the final thing that OSHA says is you have the employer would have to provide a chemical, um, a, a workplace free of chemical harm. A newer module that was required in 2016 is an international chemical safety standard called Global Harmonization System that should already be in place. And that means that your old material safety data sheets are updated to the new 
international, it's a standardized format. You get those from your dental suppliers. And there's some changes in labeling. So there's some new diagrams called pictograms. So all of those things OSHA inspectors will be looking for when they go into your office. If you would like to do updates after we complete this webinar, you can go to our website. This tab, that second tab is our COVID um, safety setup tab and it has access to videos and signs and everything that's related to, um, to OSHA, HIPAA, CDC, ADA. Again, our website is dentalenhancements.com. The second tab next to the home tab will bring you to our COVID uh, safety one hub. So visit it, visit it often, and just take advantage that all those resources are in one place. I think it's just super important to be proactive. Even though we're overwhelmed during quarantine, being proactive will mean that you'll be successful and you'll be able to really focus on getting back to dentistry and then keeping that focus on infection control as you go back into the workplace. So um, the pandemic preparedness plan, Here's what yours should include. Now you can make your own. A contingency plan should include when to go to work, when to stay home, how to monitor for the pandemic, right? Curbing your monetary losses, scheduling and screening patients, having a cooperative effort from your team, understanding how to uh, mitigate shortages on supplies and wearing pop proper PPE and infection control um, implementing practices. The Contingency plan must be included in your preparedness plan. A respiratory protection plan must be included, whether you choose N95, any kind of a respirator, um, or uh, whether you choose uh, traditional PPE, and then documents and forms. So ours is 159. It's going to be a fillable PDF. And if you go on our website, give me about a day or two, that's just getting uh, put into the PDF format. So that'll be listed on our website by the end of the week. Oh my gosh, what else is required? It's important to understand that every year your team should be going in through an annual OSHA training once per year. Once in a lifetime, you have to do that international chemical safety update called Global Harmonization System. And annually, you should be doing HIPAA. So your OSHA and HIPAA is annual. This year, you should make sure that you have a focus on infection control and uh, COVID-19 management. Um, a comprehensive program includes uh, the uh, federal annual OSHA. Once in a lifetime is your international uh, global harmonization system. And then once a year, federal HIPAA. Some states have additional protocols. So um, three things, training, train all of your employees there's about a thousand pieces of paperwork to get together between your OSHA and your HIPAA manuals and the forms and any safety data sheets uh, and now your new preparedness protocols. And then finally, um, there's a 200 protocols that you should make sure that you have in place. This is a day in the life of one of my trainers, but I don't think it's ever easy for a dental professional to take that on, right? That can be either nine additional components if you multiply uh, the three required by your training and your paperwork and your facility protocols. If you have additional state protocols, it gets even more complicated. So we understand compliance is heavy right? It can be overwhelming. It be, can be insidious. It can be really cumbersome. If you're looking for something that can take that kind of pressure off of you, um, we want to make sure that you understand it's not going to go away. This is not a good alternative. The fines this year uh, that for an average OSHA visit, are uh, they're big. They're about $13,000 per serious violation, and they go up tenfold if you don't rectify them the first time. Now, inspectors give you some time. They'll give you 60 or 90 days, as long as something's not serious. But if something is serious, it can be up to a $14,000 fine. Doesn't have to be painful. You can get your entire team really functioning um, in an easy way for way less than that. So 
uh, our solutions, I'll just talk to you about our OSHA and Have Made Easy solutions. The experience, we try to make it really connect the dot, paint by number, OSHA and HIPAA, easy to understand and implement. Um, for about $1,600, you can get your whole office up to date for OSHA, GHS, and HIPAA, including all the COVID and um, uh, uh, the infection infection control requirements, and then our team members help you. So once you get a box of books and manuals and you have access to all your training videos and forms and reports, we do have dental team members turned OSHA and HIPAA experts that will help you fill in the blanks of your binders, make customized reports that you can use with all the right answers as you set up your protocols, and just understand all this. So it's nice to have somebody uh, that's available um, our solutions are made easy, OSHA and HIPAA made easy. They do include everything, compliance manuals that you'll be able to customize. Um, we have ready to use forms, so there's a lot of OSHA and HIPAA forms. You need them for your employees, you need them for patients. Sometimes you even need them uh, for HIPAA for your vendors that use your patient information. Um, we do have employee training webinars, they're anytime webinars. Uh, video is the way to go as we're learning remotely. And then the private coaching is what really makes the difference, being able to talk to somebody who knows the laws and can help answer your questions. Um, our checklists are pretty awesome as well. I don't do this by myself. Um, I work with OSHA inspectors, uh, HIPAA lawmakers, and uh, our a legal team. So every time we learn something new, it does go through the rigors of um, our legal team. And as I finish up here, I just want to make sure and that you're choosing comprehensive programs. Make sure that you don't just do training when you're getting prepared to go back into your uh, workplace. Make sure you have all the required paperwork and then you know how to set up a list, a checklist of protocols. The difference for our team is that we have the trainers available when you're ready to ask questions. So being able to have a professional, whether it's with dental enhancements or you have a favored coach, an OSHA or HIPAA coach in your area, just make sure that you're getting your training, that you have all your required paperwork updated, and that you have your facility checklist. It's always better to have a conversation and make sure you set things up completely and properly, right? We like to offer annual updates. So as soon as you're done with one year, we always make sure we're scheduling for the next year so that you can stay in compliance for the life time of your practice. I compel you to look over your current OSHA and HIPAA programs and just make sure that they're comprehensive going back into practice. I know that health department inspectors and OSHA inspectors are out there. Even HIPAA auditors uh, are making the rounds. Um, as we leave, you may want something that's a comprehensive program for update. So this is our self-study program. It has everything, the OSHA, the HIPAA, the GHS, and it is uh, available with um, two hours of any time webinar training. So you'll get the links that you'll be able to share with your um, at-home employees. I don't have a lot of pushback from employees that are on furlough. They want their CE. They want to be able to know what's going on uh, for their safety and for infection control before they go back to work. So it's been really nice to allow office managers or doctors to get involved with our portal links and then they share educational links with their team members. We also then provide two hours of expert guided help and you'll get a big box of books. It comes with manuals and then we go through a portal uh, to show you your forms and we create two awesome reports. One of the reports is an OSHA safety facility report and then a HIPAA required report. So that gives you all the right answers for how you go back into the office and set up these protocols. So that's normally 1998, uh, the self-study program. We've just discounted it during the COVID crisis so that you can feel a little bit better about implementing that. If you wanna take advantage of this, I just want to say that um, you can give us a call. We privately will discuss your current OSHA and HIPAA status so that you say, hey, is that the right direction for me? How does it work? So if you'd like something like this in your office, um, it does include everything. And um, I'm just gonna put my cell phone 
uh, if you have any questions for me directly. But calling our office is the way to go if you want more information about solutions. And I'll always be open if you need to email me. I'm going to give you my private email as well. John, before we finish up, thank you, everyone. It was kind of a little bit longer than anticipated. Lots of information to go through. I hope it was helpful. Um, my team here and I are certainly here for your success, but I wanted to see if there were any more questions that I can answer before um, we move forward with our day. Uh, yes, ma'am. A couple of questions. Uh, does, does the service you just outlined, does it include uh, state requirements in addition to federal? It does. Yes. So if you are, as long as you're not in Michigan or Texas, Michigan or Texas has some sub modules, but like I was talking about that one Tennessee questionnaire, it will. It will always include that. When you get on the phone with one of our trainers and you're completing your reports, uh, they'll be able to show you how to access the state modules. Sometimes you have to print out 10 or 15 forms and then you put them in the binder and they'll go through and answer any specifics for your state. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, let's see here. One, one statement I would make is I would think that anytime there are, and Jill, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but this was my understanding when I was going through all this stuff years ago. Um, anytime there are a lot of updates and changes to requirements and protocols and documentation, all that kind of stuff, there it's almost like there is a, uh, a, a heightened sense of awareness on behalf of inspectors. Um, and we tend to see like an increase in the number of inspections because they, they want to go in and make sure, do like an audit to make sure that they're, everybody is complying with the new standards and all that kind of stuff. We saw that when GHS was rolled out. Would you say that that's, we, we should Absolutely. have an increase yeah. in, in that kind of stuff? Yeah. And, and I think because um, COVID is a contagious disease mm -hmm. that now we soften HIPAA requirements, right? You can do teledentistry, you can use Facebook or Skype. And because those logs, you know, reporting logs have to be posted. If some, uh, if an employee is positive or a patient is positive, the healthcare facility does have to know, hey, we're supposed to contact the health department. We're supposed to have the right reporting forms and we're supposed to have certain written documents updated in relation to the pandemic, right? So your respiratory preparedness plan and a contingency plan should we go back into relapse? So yeah, what I, I was on the phone on Saturday with one of my favorite OSHA inspectors. He's here in Tampa. I'm in Sarasota, Florida. And he was telling me what they're going to go in for. So they're working in tandem with health department, uh, health departments to make sure that these written protocols are in place and that your team members are not going back to work or in the workplace without one understanding PPE and two understanding what they're going to do in relation to patient care updated upgraded infection control mm -hmm, good point so that's definitely already happening yeah another thing that I would say too is is first and foremost if if you if an inspector comes into your office and you don't have the, they're going to ask to see your documentation, right? Certain pieces of documentation. First, If you yes. don't have that available, that just throws up a red flag for them to look for other violations. But if they, cause you got to think that they, I mean, that they've got a lot of these things to do. They don't want to spend any more time in your practice than absolutely necessary. So if you can provide all the requested information, it's readily available and I can give it to you right now and they look at it, it's all intact and accurate and current, all that kind of stuff. It alleviates their concerns and it lowers the likelihood that they're gonna start digging and trying to find more, more stuff that's not. Uh, John, I love that you said that because the very first thing, let's just pretend you have an inspector walk in the office. What do you do, right? Well, keep them <laughs> at bay for a couple minutes. You have about five minutes to get ready. Everyone should have their PPE, full regal, yeah, you know, even receptionists in this time should be wearing lab coats. They should be wearing uh, level two masks and gloves and changing those as needed. The very first thing you want to give your inspector, the thing that they expect is to sit down with your OSHA manual, your MSDS sheets, and all of your employee paperwork. If you don't have that ready, you're sunk in the water. So if everything's tidied up and ready, like our manuals are all just fill in the blanks and they're all filed and everything's filed by year and everything's right there. That's your ace in the hole. You can take the average OSHA inspection should be 30 minutes. Your paperwork's done. They're not going to bother you too much. They're going to read everything and ask maybe a few questions and be cool. If you don't have that paperwork ready, they'll definitely start going into the facility. 
So checking operatories, checking your lab, taking each person in a room. Sometimes it's like interrogation style and really questioning. So paperwork is key for an inspector, allowing them to look at everything. And if, ever, if you've crossed all the T's and dot all the I's, you're cool. So an ounce of prevention here is awesome. So I think that that is, um, I think you and I have talked about that before. Having paperwork always is the best medicine so that um, you don't have to extend that, the visit. So for sure, that's and great sure advice. Employees are educated and informed. So in the event that they, they do receive direct questions from an interrogator, from a, an inspector, they got the information, they got the yes. information really available. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, do you have to let them come into your practice um, at a moment's notice or can you require them to schedule? You know, like OSHA inspectors, they're like federal agents. So it's like saying no to a cop. I would say if you do your homework and you're proactive, what do you have to hide? I would get it over with. Yeah. I have seen in, in my experience, and I've been doing this for 30 years now, inspectors always respect if you hand them the paperwork and let them do their job. If they have to come back, then you don't want them to have an attitude or have any kind of a chip on their shoulder coming back. So well, the best thing to do, be proactive, let them in, don't have anything to hide. Just do the right thing. Study, get your checklists in order, get your protocols in order. So the best thing to do is let them in, yeah. definitely. And I would say if you stall them, or ask them to come back or something like that. You just gave them a reason to look deeper. <laughs> so, yes, for sure. For uh, sure. Isn't that the truth? So last, last question on my end, and this is related and unrelated. We have a, uh, we've got a sister company called Dennis Select that produces a product called Oracare, uh, which is an oral rinse. It's activated chlorine dioxide. Uh, it's the only rinse on the market that's currently proven to kill viruses. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's currently being tested, lab tested, uh, to determine whether or not it kills COVID. Um, so would you say that in terms of standard of care and infection control, that providing a, a, a looking for solutions or rents, whether it's this or something else, this isn't a sales pitch. Uh, I'm just curious, would you say that, that that elevated level of infection control, if, if we're implementing products and solutions that have a higher kill rate um, and those kinds of things is uh, uh, an added layer of protection in terms of infection control? I totally would. And that can go on our considerations uh, list, right? So uh, I think that it's always good if you can have a patient uh, for their own peace of mind, right? The doctors are not only supposed to be providing PPE and education for the team, but also if you have that pre-rinse, it protects the patient. And to a degree, if they're going to rinse and then have the aerosol, coming off of their body. I think that's great. And I have read about certain rinses, but that's really great, John. I can uh, read more about that. And then I'd be happy to kind of add that into our uh, slides here because that would be something else that would prove that doctors are doing some due diligence uh, and team members are kind of looking out to ensure it's the safest aerosol environment that you can, you know, have to mitigate or minimize as much as possible. Right. Yeah, and that's, really that's good. The recommended, that's the recommended protocol for it is as a pre and post operative rinse, right? Mm -hmm. Kill all the viruses and funguses and VSCs to create as clean an environment as we possibly can before the, the aerosol concerns, you know, yes, are, are exactly. Present. I do want to just go through the, the website one more time, uh, just so that you go onto the website. There is a really great um, prep list to go back to work that you might like. You just scroll all the way down. Some of the newer ADA amount announcement is at the top. We have hand washing um, uh, diagrams, cover your cough. This is the new mask diagram. So it will show you when you pop it up, it's going to show the difference between surgical N95 and other masks. And then the last little gem is a back to work prep list. And this will help you with everything uh, from headgear to PPE, to equipment, containers, everything. So I hope that uh, this was helpful. John, thank you so much for letting me be here today. Yeah. And um, as we leave, I'm just going to leave with um, putting my phone number back up here in case anyone wants to uh, contact me directly or my team. We're just really here for your success. And I can't thank you enough. I wish everyone health 
and a lot of success. There's hope for the future as we go into the new age of dentistry. Thanks a lot, John. Absolutely. Uh, Jill, I'm grateful to have you today. It's been uh, extremely informative. I'm getting a lot of great feedback, both through the chat box here and then text messages from folks that I've got attending this thing. Uh, so super, super uh, impressed with the presentation and information and just the comprehensive nature and your approach to, to OSHA and everything. So uh, yeah. very informative, fantastic information. Um, you've got Jill's contact information. Don't hesitate to reach out to her or look at her website and get any available resources. I would highly recommend that you have a third party support person helping you with OSHA and HIPAA because I'm telling you, just take it from, from my personal experience. It is an overwhelming undertaking <laughs> to try to, to try to do this stuff yourself and recreate the wheel. So I certainly would not recommend that whatsoever. A it is, it's not a value, valuable use of your time. B, no matter how thorough and comprehensive you think you have been, it's not going to be sufficient. <laughs> so, uh, so absolutely uh, reach out to Jill to get some additional information. Uh, this video has been recorded. It will be on my professional YouTube channel, uh, John Harris, J-O-N Harris. It will also be on our two Fortune Management pages here in the Southeast, channels here in the Southeast, which are Fortune Management Mid-South and Fortune Management of Georgia. Uh, if you're unable to find them, send me an email. Uh, I will uh, send you the link to the YouTube channel. Um, if you've got any questions or anything like that uh, that are OSHA related or HIPAA related, please email Jill. Um, and then uh, what am I missing? Again, if you would like to receive CE for this, uh, just send me an email. I know who's attended. Um, send me an email or respond to your registration email and I'll be sure to send CE out, uh, CE out for for attending. So I appreciate everybody attending today. Uh, Jill, thanks so much for your time. And again, it, it, we'll probably do another one of these things or maybe two more um, over the next several weeks as we get more information and updates. So uh, uh, thanks so much, everybody. Beautiful. Thanks, John. Peace, everyone. Be safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you.